Nasir for being a part of this talk. Uh, I would like to take the privilege on behalf of Nalsar, uh, Nalsar family to uh, invite Justice K. Kanan to deliver a talk today. Uh, he'll be delivering his talk on his experiences as a litigator in the Madras High Court and even before in the lower judicial, uh, in the lower courts uh, in Pondicherry, then uh, about his elevation as a judge in the Madras High Court and then his transfer to the Punjab Haryana High Court. Uh, currently, he serves as the chairman of the Railway Disputes Claim uh, Appellate Tribunal in uh, New Delhi and he is also teaching a course here on succession law. So some of us uh, have been interacting with him over the last weekend, over the last week. Uh, so uh, please, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, you may commence with your talk. Okay. Uh, good evening to all of you and uh, let me wish you all a very happy Holi. And uh, I expected uh, a visible um, coloring of uh, the holy festivity, but I see it's uh, not there, but I suppose it's all worn off. I just uh, got to know something about the Nyaya Forum, and uh, it was a student's initiative, and it's uh, uh, an initiative that makes people take a look at litigation as an important option, as uh, there is a concern that a lot of people are going towards uh, the corporate life. Um, when I uh, talk about uh, spiritual journey, uh, one would expect uh, an old man could be talking about spiritual journey, fair enough. Uh, but then if I am saying, uh, judging as a spiritual journey, I want you to understand that a person who sees himself in the judge's place, he has a unique situation of having to judge people. In a spiritual life one talks about how not to be judging people, how to let people behave the way they are, uh, see yourself in the others and uh, feel comfortable. If these are all the things which a spiritual life could be, what is it that we are talking about judging as a spiritual journey? I had a blog for some time when I was a lawyer and when he was an editor of a law journal and uh, it went by the name being non-judgmental. It was possible to be non-judgmental in my ways. I used at all times, uh, a third person singular never put myself there. I didn't want to sound pompous one. I didn't want uh, anyone to think uh, I am uh, taking that uh, smarter than thou attitude. So I was very defensive about what I was writing. I had no personal opinions expressed there. But then when I was a judge, I knew I was judging at all the time. And therefore, uh, it is uh, not possible to be non-judgmental there. I have um, worked, but for a, a short period at the Madras High Court before I was uh, taken to the Punjab and Haryana High Court. And uh, standing before you, I must uh, say that uh, I'm no big celebrity uh, judge or a celebrity lawyer at any time. I didn't drive swanky cars. I didn't have a large mansion. I didn't have any superstar clients. But I was uh, an editor of a small journal, of a Madras Law Journal. Uh, but I did something unusual there about the, uh, about the journal. It, I used to run an edit page, the first page, uh, in a law journal. It's normally not done. Uh, I used to write everything about uh, uh, matters of interest that could, a lawyer could be interested about. And uh, wherever they were not uh, too much about law, and there were some matters of general interest, I used to upload it also in my site. So I began uh, rather um, uh, in some way communicative to people and I had uh, some kind of a following and I realized when I was a judge it was not going to be possible therefore I stopped it. I was rather compelled to stop and it became a star question in the parliament. Does a judge blog? Does he have a right to blog? So therefore I never knew that this could uh, take an attention there in the parliament and somebody could be asking about it. And uh, 
it so happened that uh, there was at that time a particular judgment which was rather unusual. Uh, this was uh, about a student, uh, a medical college, an aspiring medical college student uh, who had applied and it was run by a SGPC college. It, it was run by SGPC and uh, SGPC, the Shiromani uh, uh, the institution of Sikhs, it uh, enjoyed a minority status. Whether uh, Sikhs could be minority within the state of Punjab is itself a question and the uh, full bench had answered that it cannot be. It's a matter before the Supreme Court, before a larger bench. So uh, there was uh, a full bench constituted when this girl had brought a writ petition before the High Court where she was not granted admission because the admission criteria were that you'll have to declare that you are a believer in Sikh and you believe in the ten gurus and no more than that and there will be also a physical verification by a committee of persons. Uh, the, the committee will examine whether a person has shaved uh, or clipped his hair or trimmed his beard and for a woman it will be seen whether she had cut her hair or tweezed her eyebrow. This was the uh, consideration. So therefore, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, Tavleen who uh, was not granted admission, she brought a challenge saying that this is not correct. And uh, uh, Justice Mudgal was here some time back. He was the Chief Justice at the time. And he had caused a reference to be made when the matter was brought in, uh, uh, before him that it should be referred to a full bench. The full bench question was, what, is the, what are the essential tenets of Sikhism? Now, uh, this judgment run, done by three judges, it uh, runs to 160 pages. And uh, the, the judgment starts with a flourish. Uh, writing this judgment was an, hearing the case and writing the judgment was an experience of sorts. And it says, we had allowed for people to participate in the proceedings before us, not merely in court, but allowed emails to be written to us. Persons from London, from Toronto, to uh, uh, Auckland, uh, to Melbourne, they had all joined in the conversations. And even in the courts, it was just not the lawyers who were arguing, and there were persons in the gallery from the public who would also make the submissions. So that uh, judgment goes on to say that one of them, the person who was writing the judgment himself being a Sikh, he was examining himself and said, I am not a perfect Sikh. Uh, I have trimmed my hair. But I know what it all means. And if there was SGPC was laying down what was the consideration for admission, what, what the criteria shall be. And uh, our Sikh gurus have laid down some precepts. There is no way he can make any modification for that. So he was saying that if a person trims his hair or a beard or tweezes her eyebrow, it was fair enough for consideration for rejection and the application was dismissed. This judgment uh, for me was a shocking judgment. But to many, it so happened that a person who wrote the judgment immediately was also elevated to another court as a chief justice. And there were a lot of uh, articles, uh, there were a lot of people who spoke because a person is now leaving the court to, to a higher office and therefore you have immediately uh, meetings organized. And at the time, the meeting, uh, in, in one of the meetings it was stated that the finest exposition of Sikhism we have got, we are grateful to the uh, Honorable Judge who wrote. Uh, but uh, I probably uh, made a tongue-in-cheek remark uh, through uh, the relevance of his suit for admission what I wrote in my blog. I said uh, this uh, case asked the wrong question came by a wrong answer. The issue could never have been whether th these aspects of, of consideration for admission were essential tenets of Sikhism. For the essential tenets of Sikhism are already given there and it is for the gurus or probably the priests to say what is the court, court to do about it. The question that must have been asked was was this a relevant criterion for admission into medical college? If you would ask that question, you would have come by a correct answer. For why would it be that a person must be eusutic? Or why should a person be not trimmed? And why would it not, what has anything to do, uh, what has looks or any physical appearance to do with admission to a college? 
this one I wrote in a bit. It's a, it's a, uh, my blogs never exceeded 800 words. I always limited that because it can't, uh, attention span cannot be for more than one, uh, for a survey in one eye. When I put it up, uh, there was uh, enough murmur within our uh, members of the uh, bench that they felt upset that one of their finest judgments was criticized by a fellow judge. I realized I was probably uh, uh, doing something which was not immediately acceptable. I withdrew the block on that day and said goodbye to it. I'm saying this because at all times uh, I had uh, spoke fearlessly and if I had done at various uh, things that, uh, which were not very popular, I was not uh, looking for any attention, but it was just a natural thing for me, a typical litigant, uh, litigation lawyer, finding what is wrong about what the other person says. So uh, to a Nyaya forum, I thought I should start how it all happened for me, how I began and how I dropped this blog. Now, um, when I'm talking about the spiritual journey, uh, what are we going to be saying? I thought I should begin with what was my preoccupation as a lawyer and what did I carry as a judge. To me, getting at the truth was the most important activity that a lawyer must be involved in. I believe so. And as a judge, I, I thought in every case, what is the truth there? One of my friends, a, who is a close friend and who is a judge of the Delhi High Court, uh, he has a very graphic illustration of what his activity is about. He's again uh, very prolific in his judgments. He has done several uh, novel ways of getting at the motor accident claims. And uh, it was from him I learned a technique of using Section 165 of the Evidence Act. A person who have done uh, Evidence Act will know it gives the power of a court, power to a judge, to call for any person at any time to ask any question relevant or irrelevant. So therefore this kind of a, a license you don't have in any other provision. You can get any person at any time at any stage of the litigation and ask relevant or irrelevant questions. Why? To get at the complete truth. To do complete justice. It's something similar to what you have in the constitutional jurisprudence or what the Supreme Court's power or to do complete justice. What do you do under section 165? So therefore, uh, get at the truth was the important activity for my, it was almost a kind of an obsession for me, case after case. And then I realized, as you go along, it is not always the truth that is possible to be elicited. Particularly in criminal cases, the way our cases are done, the cases are done on what is beyond reasonable doubt. Is it something like that or you, you can't have any doubt left with it? And the prosecution is invariably at some, uh, uh, they bring about so many frills about the case and uh, the attempt by the defense shall at many times be, be um, picking holes in that and trying to show that this is uh, too out, uh, outlandish, it can't stick. So therefore, uh, make holes somewhere here, there and the story cannot be true. This is what it is. The real attempt to get at the truth never gets to be happening in a criminal trial. So even while judging criminal cases, therefore, there was a problem. And I must say, I have held but a very short period uh, during the uh, vacation courts, uh, perhaps in the general uh, red jurisdiction where I had to do some cases, or specially assigned cases of criminal cases. I had a lot of interest uh, in the criminal law. But then uh, in the work which I've done, they had been limited. I'm going to say, therefore, a few things about the criminal cases which I did and what my attempt had been. And uh, there was another area where some of the aspects of what you find, the higher uh, court orders are grossly inconvenient. And uh, it uh, does not allow you to travel and make possible the administration of justice, how it should be done. So what is the kind of a dilemma that a person goes through? And how do you secure the answers? To me, it was uh, a kind of a looking for a voice within, if you would believe or looking for some direction, how to secure justice to the person. And uh, I'll uh, refer to cases where um, some provisions of law for empowerment, or particularly women, children, and if they could be stifled through some approaches, which are uh, by the higher forums, how do you still make possible uh, yeah, an administration or application of that law, which can be truly uh, empowering to the cl classes of persons for whom it was enacted. 
so uh, I'll therefore uh, outline four or five cases of what I have done, try to illustrate what my spiritual journey was. First is an as uh, aspect relating to a simple motor accident case. Uh, ever so many times it is that we look for a minimum standard of proof in a motor accident claim for a person who is injured or dead on the road is uh, not expected to be proving the same way as it is to be done in a criminal trial. Therefore, what you want to do is, is it possible that an accident took place? You don't really question too much about what is the extent of negligence. You believe, you don't uh, carefully run through a person, uh, run against a person. You, there is a carelessness at all times. A person who is injured uh, or who is dead on the road is uh, invariably a victim of a person who has driven the car, whatever. There is no question of carefulness and uh, uh, an injury on the road. They do not marry. They have to be at, uh, in some way without a car only. There is something which is happening happening. A simple tort law principle. Uh, I, I, this was a case about uh, a person who is injured on the road was driving a motorcycle and the vehicle which was said to have been involved was uh, a vehicle belonging to a school, to uh, a very popular school there in Chandigarh. The accident had taken place I'm talking about 1989 case. It was uh, uh, about four months after the accident, the FAR had been lodged. Students of law know who run through the procedure of criminal procedure that uh, the earliest attempt, the delay in uh, filing FAR is normally a very big event. It uh, will have to explain a big, a big way. So therefore, this was a case where after four months, a case was instituted, uh, uh, FAR was uh, lodged. But the trial court, the modern accident claims tribunal did not uh, think too much about it. He thought, now a case has been registered good enough, therefore this vehicle must have been involved and allowed for compensation for the person. The school had therefore hired uh, uh, the, the top uh, uh, notch counsel of uh, Chandigarh, a senior counsel. He had not much to argue, he merely sta started with saying, it's a case where an accident was said to have uh, happened uh, sometime in May. Uh, the complaint is laid in September and the court acts on that and then uh, uh, makes the uh, uh, school pay compensation, the insurance pay, uh, pay compensation to 4 lakhs. 4 lakhs is no big deal, but then that was the kind of compensation which was uh, ordered. Now therefore, before uh, much happened, I asked the counsel, who was again led through uh, a person the, the, for the um, person who was the injured victim had engaged a counsel who was one of the most prominent counsel of Chandigarh. He said, sir, uh, I don't know, I may not be able to support what has happened, but there is something probably about it. Uh, will, you, will you get the criminal court records for us? And the other side lawyer obviously did not agree to that. Why should it be uh, done? What was the need? You are not saying that there was anything wrong about the criminal prosecution. Uh, how do you want that? Somewhere I thought, now if there is something he is going to secure, if it is going to get a truth, let us see what happens. The criminal court records were being sent. It, it had to be fairly a long order because it was subjected. There was no reason why he should be calling some criminal court records. And then when it came, uh, both of them had, uh, had a look at the uh, document. And there was one piece of paper. It is written in the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the letter pad of the school by the principal. It ran, uh, it ran into just three lines. It says, the transport in charge is authorized by our school to get the release from police and courts and negotiate with the concerned party. This is a three line uh, expression, may to whomsoever it may concern. So I thought now the transport in charge is a person who has to uh, secure, the, uh, is authorized to get the release of the bus. Uh, what would that mean? A release of the bus is probably somewhere there. And it was on the same date when the accident had taken. So I, I thought that the transport in charge must come. And I also got the principal coming there, principal of the school. When the principal was there, when I asked him, uh, what would this mean? Uh, you have uh, got, uh, uh, you asked uh, uh, for some authorization, you have given some authorization for someone to receive, to uh, secure the bus. What would that mean? The, he was uh, in the witness stand and uh, he was explaining that uh, you know what happens, the, pol the police every now and then they seize the bus for uh, frivolous reasons, there is no vehicular documents which are there, therefore we'll, they will take it. So uh, I asked him, now there is no vehicular document, the vehicle will be seized now and then, you, you, to be, you used to be harassed like this, but is it not uh, unfair, would you ever put the children to such harassment, children going by the bus, uh, would you ever put them to such kind of difficulty of the driver not taking uh, documents with him? 
Then he said, no, look at our driver, the transporting child and the driver, they are hopeless persons, they are always careless. Then I told him, now it says uh, from the bus and should be released from the police and uh, courts. Uh, don't you think it's, uh, what, what is it that you did? See, uh, I don't know why it was referred to uh, courts. Something was written, I signed up and then uh, I didn't know what it was. Uh, you didn't know what it was, so you signed uh, and you didn't w uh, know why the vehicle was uh, sought to be taken from courts. You had, no sus uh, you had no suspicion that it was going to be in courts. He said, no, I didn't know what it contained. Then I pointed out to him, it said, uh, uh, it's typewritten and it says uh, police and courts that ampersand is in the same ink as the ink which you have used for signing the document, is it not? He said, uh, I don't know. I did not know anything about it. I don't know the results. I did not write. Only my signature is mine. It became clear then at that time. A simple thing of a three-line uh, uh, letter uh, which showed that a person who has, the moment you ask him, why is there a reference to court, you say, now I did not know. And then you show that there is an ampersand which is written in hand and it was the same signature of the person, it was the same hand in the same ink as the person who signed the signature. It became clear that he was the one who had done. And then I was looking for more and then I realized that from the file, I was turning on the pages in the file and I found that there is a letter from the person, the father of the victim saying, uh, please uh, release the uh, vehicle, the vehicle and the bus have been seized at the same time. It became too clear. What was not brought before the court, whenever a vehicle is seized, it has to be produced before the court and then a person applies for release of the vehicle. They had probably, the police at that time had taken some papers that kept the vehicle, then got to the uh, police uh, uh, the, uh, to say, some officer said, now the school is a big school, they want the uh, school uh, bus back, give it back. So, a uh, lot of things, uh, then the uh, uh, council for the school was saying, getting the uh, uh, vehicle released, the motorbike released, it was not a case, anybody's case, that the vehicle was uh, seized. So, therefore, what are we looking at? He didn't realize that was the one which really showed that the bus was seized, the motorcycle was also seized on the same day. It was a clear uh, statement that it was obvious that the, both the vehicles had been involved in some kind of collision and therefore it happened. It may be just a small thing, but I'm merely to, merely to say that uh, everything, if you probe a little more, you get answers which you never believe could have ever been uh, obtained. In fact, in my... Uh, uh, court, Del, uh, Punjab and Haryana did not have uh, your original, an original site, uh, but there used to be some way for election cases uh, in each court, if some judge were to hold as election cases, so therefore there would be a witness stand. Uh, in witness stands in all courts would collect dust. In my court it used to be an active uh, place for I have brought any number of police persons, any number of uh, officers, any number of uh, uh, even the chairman of the public sector undertaking uh, when he had not granted uh, the, uh, pen the pension payments, the uh, uh, terminal uh, uh, benefits. I put him there in the witness stand would cross exam. So every day there would used to be some cross examination of somebody. I took it upon myself as uh, a, a kind of a duty that uh, if you want to get a truth, just don't go by the affidavits because from our practice in Indian condition, anyone understand, I do hereby solemnly state on oath as follows, is always understood as uh, on, uh, on oath untruth as follows is what we do. The affidavits, the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, tissues of lies uh, that uh, keep happening there in courts, no court takes it very seriously. We are all burdened in some way. There are so many cases which are there. A case is over, we are happy. Not the use of section 340 CRPC is just not done. Perjury, nobody cares. If there is untruth in court, nobody cares. If it is there, or it's also this is not true, I disbelieve it, case is uh, uh, decreed, dismissed. In the circumstances, no cost. In circumstances, why there would be no cost? In a case where somebody is coming with a false defense or a false case, cost must immediately follow the event. But it's never done in our courts. For all of us share some kind of a guilt. We take a long time for any case to be decided. Why do I impose cost on anyone? Let it, he has taken his time, I have taken my time. All right, no, no cost. So therefore, this is how it would go. Uh, 
for me therefore uh, i thought this is how i'll go in each case i will look at what is correct what is true what is to be elicited i will show an enormous anxiety where somebody would be uh, some of my colleagues used to be surprised what are we trying to do brother what what is the attempt which you are trying to do everybody comes to court you think everyone must be true everyone must be speaking truth there will be no litigation so it was somewhere thought that there has to be untruth in court and that is what is done it is fine anyone to be telling a lie is fine this is what was seen but i thought in my court i would take a long uh, i would take a very serious view if there is something which is untrue which is stated uh, then i realized as i went uh, that at, uh, in criminal cases not at all times you are able to get at the truth there are issues it was particularly one case uh, of uh, almost all uh, all judges had recused themselves at various times and uh, the case was brought to me just as takur was the chief justice at the time for us and he had put it to me i was a person from an outside court there was never a problem now anybody will not know this man will not know this judge does not know the names of lawyers there is fine now put a, put a, put the case before him it's fine so therefore it was one uh, the the father and son uh, they were uh, the father was a senior counsel the son was a, 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 a budding lawyer and uh, they were practitioners in the supreme court as well and they had been booked for a case of possession of 50 kilograms of heroin uh, and uh, 50 crores it was uh, stated it was all in front page uh, uh, papers uh, uh, in all papers carried the news and uh, i had not known this has happened before i went there the it was a case of seizure of this uh, uh, heroin uh, some uh, somewhere in the night and uh, through a secret informer and uh, they were supposed to have been carried between uh, the two legs of the person who was driving so there were questions like whether so much of uh, luggage can be kept between two feet and the person can still be driving so therefore and then where else could it have been kept and then the next day paper uh, this is what for them the police had a, a happy event of 50 kilograms and 50 crore seizure was a big big deal so therefore it was in the paper uh, the next day paper at uh, the next day uh, day after next at 3 o'clock uh, supposed to have been done uh, all uh, the plastic uh, large uh, bags with their open they're open and then uh, police uh, one police uh, twirling his mustache another person looking very seriously another person with a, a fat paunch looking very happy at the place and uh, they were all the uh, uh, press people taking the photograph and uh, it was surely a, ma- a matter of a great uh, uh, achievement for the police to have gone for such a serious uh, seizure so it was all in the next day's paper of what the police had, uh, the punjab police had achieved it was something like that it's a matter of great pride so therefore this was uh, uh, a major point there at the time of trial as well because in ndps cases the first thing as soon as you make a seizure uh, what you do is uh, you inform the person that you are uh, uh, there is a char- uh, there is a gazetted officer it has to be the seizure must be done in the presence of a uh, gazetted officer you should you should be informed that there is a gazetted officer would you would you uh, allow yourself to be searched then the the goods are taken and they are taken in samples each sample to be taken sealed and kept the the sealing takes place immediately so that there is no scope for anybody to be adding something else or if it was not for instance it was just husk and then you have some uh, uh, rice uh, rice barn or something and then you add up and then make it appear as though it is uh, here and what would happen so therefore seizure sealing all that is an important thing but then the police somewhere thought all this is not important and the trial court went about and then landed uh, 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 serious uh, uh, the maximum punishment which was suffered at there was given and uh, both these persons had come on an appeal that it was the appeal which is which was posted before me because many of the uh, though i was not in the criminal roast the case came to me because i was an outsider who will not be influenced by the local person the the, the member of the, the two prominent members of the bar so um, i found at the time of trial and uh, at the time of hearing the arguments of several things which were uh, unusual the trial court had said what is uh, the motive for a prosecution to do something as stupid as the, uh, uh, as uh, uh, stupid as filing a case if it was not for truth so therefore the court was approaching the matter as the police had uh, prosecuted unless it was true it cannot be uh, it could not could not have been drawn uh, it could not have been done 
and then uh, this whether he could have kept it in the uh, leg uh, between the legs or kept it underneath these are all very small variations this is not something which will give a very important uh, uh, consideration so now um, i had to be therefore seeing and i i said this uh, i i found that there was a heavy you know, recovery they said and i wrote in my order it beats logic as to how the police should be shown to have a motive for foisting a case motive is invariably look for the version of an independent witness as to why he was making a statement for or against the accused or why the accused participated in the occurrence against a particular victim it is never a matter of relevance as to why the police could foist a case it may have many reasons to do so or it could be a case of mistaken identity it may be a sheer pride of announcing that they have apprehended the accused when all that they required were goods without a trace of who the culprits were it could be just an occasion to set his course at the instance of some powerful persons i just was looking for the reasoning and then i found so many things gave way uh, the uh, the person who was said to be a secret informer had been uh, had a case where about seven eight cases where in about 20 cases he had been shown as a witness and when this uh, the, the vehicle which was said to have carried this was uh, uh, the rta showed the regional transport authority showed it belonged to uh, the brother of the accused and the brother had not been uh, examined at all was nor was he booked no statement was taken by him the vehicle had not been seized the, there was no re and the police had to give how there was all these parcels were open and police people were there therefore they said we had carried, we had seized something uh, huge but we wanted to therefore create a dummy property there make it look as though it was uh, 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 here on and uh, therefore we carried photographs it was to create an effect for the people so therefore there were so many uh, problems i'm not going through all of them but then uh, i i said uh, that criminal cases have um, very uh, strange occurrences for if a person is convicted and it turns out in the appellate court uh, an acquittal uh, takes place I, I could not really find where where was this 50 kilograms where did it come from who did it belong to how did it uh, come to be seized these are all questions which i could not get so getting at the truth i realized in the criminal trials there were limitations it was not possible at all times to get at the truth so this is how i could conclude accused persons who have been under incarceration for over 5 years could not be interested in knowing any more than the last sentence of a judgment whether the convictions are sustained or set aside any counseling rendered in a judgment for a need to search their own conscience and lead honest lives would only be taken as insipid pontification still i cannot leave without exhorting to them the strange of the ways of the world one may not have always understood why a particular person comes by needless suffering for no wrong done call it fate destiny divine will bad luck and what have you but the inexorable truth is cause and effect are tools of science neither of theology nor of superstition the appellants alone shall know searching their own conscience whether it was another kafka's trial or whether it was some kind of nemesis catching up the pregnant last sentence shall be that the judgment and the appeal is set aside the appeal is allowed and the appellants are set at liberty i concluded this way because uh, i i have at all times in, uh, uh, all of us confront with this predicament in courts that we are not able to dispose of any case quickly ever so many occasions are when a person is there in ndps cases he is large he is not uh, entitled to any anticipatory bail the bail does not at all times happen immediately and the uh, the case goes on for trial for 4 or 5 years the person would have been inside and the trial ultimately would have ended in an acquittal for 5 years he had been there already the same way as what you find also in this tada cases or cases in terrorist violence where a person who is uh, taken behind and where he does not get the bail the case takes 10 years and later the case is the person is set aside uh, acquitted and then he has gone through this 10 years where is he going to get that period not in every case does the court ever think of awarding compensation to a person it happened to us in a case where in punjab and haryana where uh, a person was murdered seven persons were convicted and punjab takes a long time before uh, 302 appeals come up for a hearing they become ripe for hearing after the seventh year when the uh, matter was being heard by a division bench the so called dead person appeared in court i am very much here sir alive 
So it was uh, a surprising thing. The court had to see whether this was the man that died. So they found that that was the man which was supposed to have, who was supposed to have died. Was there any need for an argument at that time? There was none. And the court had to be therefore immediately saying all these people have served seven years of sentence that the dead man is there appearing in court. Uh, it was not uh, some magic, but then the police had obviously gone against the wrong person or believed some person to be dead when he was not dead or real dead person was not really identified and the person who was responsible for that person was not uh, seen. And it so happened that the court awarded one crore compensation. Punjab, the good thing about it is money is never an issue. It's always, while every other court will grant compensation in 5,000 and 10,000 and lakh of rupees, it will go in crores. So therefore, it was, uh, uh, that was Punjab, the exuberance of Punjab will make it happen. So therefore, one crore compensation was given, probably the highest compensation that has been granted in any case for a wrongful prosecution that the bench did. So therefore, um, these are uh, things, at least some reparation happens in some cases, but in many cases where we don't. But time, it is a long time. The criminal practice therefore is where you don't really get at the truth, but still point out to some uh, lacuna. It's interesting the way it goes, uh, to person that decides, the persons who prepare, the persons who do. There's so much life in it all. So therefore, it's a matter to be interested in how we go about it, how to build a practice in that. And uh, I, I had, um, uh, at another occasion, uh, a strange case uh, which uh, was uh, poignant in, its, uh, in, every, in every way. It was a case of uh, a man, an old man in a village, who was uh, prosecuted for rape and murder of his daughter. Uh, this was uh, too harsh. Uh, and... Uh, um, there was a public interested uh, person, a lady uh, from a nearby place, who knew this man to be a, a person of exemplary character. There was no way he could have done anything like that. To rape a daughter and kill her is the, the horrible thing. And she carried out an investigation on her own. She found that there were two M sons of MLA, two MLAs, who had uh, been the perpetrators of this uh, heinous crime. But because they were so powerful, and uh, they wanted to find a scapegoat in someone. They found the father himself as a person who could be prosecuted like this. She had carried out an extensive investigation, brought all the materials before the uh, court. She came through a writ petition and a division bench of the Punjab and Haryana High Court held that the prosecution was wrong. It did not allow for a further prosecution, further trial to carry you. It, it quashed the proceedings and then uh, set that old man at liberty. A case was filed before uh, the court in the general uh, miscellaneous uh, 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 subject when I was uh, dealing the roster of uh, repetitions. And I found this was uh, grossly unfair. And it was uh, done by some uh, young lawyer there. And uh, I allowed for a compensation of, uh, I don't know if it was uh, 5 lakhs or 10 lakhs, I had granted some compensation to this person. The Indian Express did something. It wanted to know who is this man who had done that and he gets a compensation of 5 lakhs, it was wrongly, uh, uh, he was wrongly prosecuted, he is therefore getting some compensation, we will go and make some search. Indian Express carried a front page story saying that they, the, their, uh, their servants, their uh, um, journalists had gone to the village to find that this man was not alive. This man was not alive, therefore they wanted to find what had happened to the family. They had fled the village because they were too humiliated to stay on in that village. This is the story. The court grants compensation after 10 years of a person who was previously prosecuted and later let at large. And the court has awarded compensation. That poor man is not even alive to take it. And what is more, even the members of the family are not there. Now, uh, this is good enough news for the uh, government. The, I, I had awarded compensation of uh, 5 lakhs or 10 lakhs. And I also said the, the money must be recovered from the senior superintendent of police who must take the responsibility for this kind of a thing. He may not have been there standing in askings as to how it happened. But then there must be someone who must hold his head out. And this man must put his head in shame for he had allowed his subordinate to take uh, this kind of a prosecution against a man. They did not have the courage to go against the local MLAs. Now, the, both this uh, SSP and uh, the government had come with a review application before me, pointing out as a first point, uh, uh, of the first point for consideration, 
uh, this is a compensation awarded for a defamation or a personal loss of liberty and that is personal to the person and he having died the legal representatives have no cause of action and it is barred under section 306 of the Indian Succession Act. My God, I knew what, what is to be done. Now, uh, 306 of the Indian Succession Act is a clear bar for allowing for the, the principle for allowing for uh, compensation to be given. The principle uh, was uh, the uh, monitor person, uh, 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 Maxim, would know it dies with the person. Uh, right, a personal action dies with the person. So therefore, I had to be looking out for reason. Now, what do I do? Uh, I, 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 I thought this can't uh, happen. This family members, these family members had also, therefore, uh, this wife and uh, uh, the wife had also died. The sons and daughter, they had uh, filed application for impleadment. They were living in some other village. They also knew about it only when the local vernacular papers gave them news that the person had uh, uh, the, the person had died the court had granted compensation who is there to receive so they thought they will come and receive it but then they, they had to confront with an objection like this seemed formidable to me i i found that there were two things the law commission had recommended for the abrogation of 306 of the indian succession act it was a full bench ruling of justice uh, rama joyce from karnataka who said that this is archaic even in england where the maxim originated they have discarded this what is it that we are trying to re retain this and uh, therefore i had uh, said i thought um, this was also some topic which i spoke on uh, at ils uh, pune of uh, the relevance of uh, the, uh, the the concurrent list and what uh, how do we make it relevant uh, to be purposeful I, I, uh, I uh, spoke there and they later I wrote. I would just like to read to you what I thought and how I approached the issue. One was that there is something, a serious deficit in law. We need to set it right. And our, our parliament does not have time. Other than fighting, uh, there is very little time for any productive uh, legislation making. There is a very serious issue. And then where does the uh, change come about? The change has happened for some in Kerala, where they are made through the concurrent list. Tort is something, a civil wrong is in the concurrent list. And Kerala has brought about a legislation. I said now something else must be done. Therefore I said, so many important statutory changes have come through state initiatives in the field of education, looking at the Capitation Fee Abolition Act. And the Right to Information Act, it came through various other states. Uh, it, uh, it came in Tamil Nadu in 1997, Goa, Rajasthan, Maharashtra, Assam, Madhya Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir, all before 2005, before the RDA Act of the Central Act came. Same way, even in the Hindu uh, women getting equal rights to men in the Kopar Sanari came much before 2005 in the, all the southern states, started with Andhra Pradesh uh, with, under N.T. Ramarao, later Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and uh, later in Maharashtra. I said the efficacy of the concurrent list lies in a proactive state endeavor to fill up areas where the union has not acted, nor has the time to act. Several stakeholders could take control to make this pos possible. An enlightened bar can, could frame a model legislation and petition to the government to frame a law. Academic bodies and colleges have also the competency to engage in debates and discussions to help the government shape its laws. I'm saying this, I'm placing it before uh, a, a student forum uh, like Nyaya, only because there are so many things which are essential in the field of education of what you are truly concerned about. Uh, make possible the kind of discussions happening. It could be a mock parliament or it could be anything for a discussion. Because it has happened. This is not something new. I'm going to talk about Sivasama here among other things. Uh, other, uh, 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 in that I will also make reference about. It had happened through the Madras Bar where when the Land Encroachment Act came in 1905, it was uh, a manner in which the British was trying to usurp property in, a man, uh, in some ways which were dubious. Uh, whatever property previously, uh, the, the property which it could take uh, control was only to secure, to the extent of control was possible, was to levy kist or revenue and recover. But then Land Encroachment Act became a new enactment by which any property which is unoccupied, it said it is uh, occupied by somebody, it is uh, to be treated as unlawful occupation, it will be ejected and the government will take over. So therefore, government taking over property became possible through a land encroachment act, and this was opposed. But then fact was that the act 
act stood with some modifications. But the bar rose up and they petitioned and made some possible important changes happening. There had been at some point of time uh, practitioners at the bar who have participated very strongly in legislation making. It is now perhaps even the bar is not, I can't trust even the bar. I know the kind of things which are happening or the members of the bar council, they are the last persons who will who in, infuse any discipline into activities. I have uh, no stakes and therefore I, uh, I uh, feel comfortable to say that. But then it should be possible for students to take up something. They should be able to debate and see whatever is the important area of legislation they should be able to do. Top law is crying for attention. It looks in so many areas of where strict liability norm to be enforced and how it should be done. There is so much, it can be, so much that can be done. It's not happening because there's no legislation which is happening in the direction. This is probably a reminder and therefore I said it should be done. It's another thing which I read, uh, wrote, I, because I was trying to find how the law is inconvenient, how will you go out, outside and how will you be able to secure a compensation for the parents? It may be seen, it may seem like an individual case for an individual person. It was not. I was literally expanding the frontiers of section 306 of what the legislation did not offer to me, or what changes have not happened where, where I don't see any changes happening. I still thought by interpretation of that provision, we'll be able to expand the frontier. And I said, therefore, a remedy through resort to a civil court normally addresses civil rights and allows for reliefs to a person who is aggrieved. Issue of local standing is at all times relevant for a court to grant a remedy only to the person whose right is trampled upon. The public law remedies have always opened fresh vistas and discarded the rule of standing. The objection that the issue of local standing could never be alien to public law remedy was discarded by reasoning that idle and whimsical plaintiffs, a dilatante who litigates for a lark, is a specter which haunts the legal literature and not the courtroom. This observation of Australian Law Reforms Committee was referred to by the Supreme Court in a passage in the Supreme Court's judgment in Fertilizer Corporation versus Union. The Supreme Court was discarding the floodgates theory that courts will be besieged by frivolous litigations if the rule of standing was relaxed. The jurisdiction exercised by the constitutional courts like the Supreme Court and the High Court would travel beyond the realm of ordinary civil rights and chart out paths of good governance and expand to secure a high, high quotient of fairness. Stating that false imputation of rape and murder and consequential incarceration constituted humiliation, I said, what happened in this case was an epitome of unfairness to a man who has not even given time to grieve the death of his daughter. He was humiliated as having raped and killed her. Humiliation could never be merely to the father. The persons who are now seeking the relief as what was already granted to the father were literally not the representatives of that humiliation. They were persons who had been humiliated themselves. They were just, they were traumatized and they were being hounded out of the village and account of infamy suffered by the father and themselves. A close-knit family could not have just let the father suffer in silence by uh, uh, alone. The whole family ought to have suffered in the process. The nature of case was that I am prepared to believe that the father was fighting a case just not for himself. He was fighting for all of the members of the family in a public law, law in a public law litigation and uh, citing Chairman Railway Board versus uh, uh, Chandi, uh, Chandima Das where a court was providing for compensation for a rape victim to a lawyer because the woman was too humiliated to come to court to defend her own action. I said it should be possible for anyone to approach the court and if the father had approached, he was approaching for all the members of the family and therefore it is not really a representative the father who is claiming these are persons who are making the claim in their own right of what was granted. I could uh, expand that in uh, uh, 306 and I could say that and uh, there, there are other areas uh, also where you find some progressive laws are uh, stultified by some uh, narrow approaches. This was a typical situation of what I confronted in uh, a case where a division bench by, uh, held, uh, headed by uh, Justice Cole, who is now the Supreme Court judge and who was uh, the Chief Justice uh, there in uh, Punjab and Haryana High Court, had a strange case before him. The former Chief Justice of Punjab and Haryana was there before, uh, before him. He, was, uh, uh, he had come to him saying, Shanti Swaroop is his name. Shanti Swaroop, Chief Justice, uh, came to the court with a uh, writ petition saying, protect me from my son and daughter-in-law. They are harassing me no end. They are not prepared to go out of my house. They, are, uh, they make my life miserable. Therefore, protect me against my uh, son and daughter-in-law. 
the, he was applying under the legislation Maintenance and Welfare of Parents and Senior Citizens Act of 2007. He said protection which, is, which the section contemplates must extend to protection of a senior citizen who is having trouble with his own son. Therefore, he should be uh, uh, shown the door. In fact, in uh, uh, Allahabad judgment in the year 1926 was a case where father's right to eject a riotous son was recognized under Hindu law. So, uh, uh, the, the point was whether somebody could be thrown out of the house because he's traveling in the house. is rather unusual that you would have a pro provision. But then, you imagine a chief justice of a court who he presided is there before you and he is coming to chief justice court again and saying, now give me protection in my house from my son and daughter-in-law. Therefore, the order was passed by the division by saying, this act must be understood as allowing for any parent to come to court and seek for protection and if there is a son and daughter-in-law who create a problem they can be thrown out of the house now this was the judgment and which is uh, there in place now a case was by a woman who is uh, thrown out of the house by her father-in-law the, uh, the provision which she was invoking was protection of women against domestic violence act of 2005 that act provides uh, a shelter as an important ingredient of a protection. So therefore it said any person, uh, the, the person could have an approach to a court and you have section 26 of the act which, which if you are going to study at any time you will know the provisions of the act can be incorporated at any time in any, any proceeding and be applied. So therefore, this woman, when she filed this application, this legislation, this decision was shown. I said, now you want protection from the house? There is no way. The father-in-law is putting you out. You will have to abide by that. So there was a clear division bench I was bound by. How would I get out of it? So uh, there was a, a problem. So I said, sometimes we keep doing that. Uh, we find that something which is inconvenient, we refer it to be confined to the facts. So I took some courage because I knew that evening I was going to still see the Chief Justice for something. You would have definitely asked me, what have you done? You are trying to say your judgment was, my judgment was not a judgment uh, for a point of law, but uh, confined to a particular case, but I did that, by, I did that all the same. But uh, what I said was this. Even a protective and legislation like the Protection of Women's Violence Act of 2005 will be rendered futile if it were to be wrongly assumed that a father can throw out his daughter-in-law, that a husband can throw out the wife, a strange wife, a divorced wife. The provisions of the Maintenance Act of 2007 and the Act of 2005 cannot be used for cross purposes, one annihilating the other. A parent who invokes the provisions of the Act for a protection which is, uh, cannot do anything which can sully the right which can be protected under, which is protected under Act of 2005. The provisions for protection which is contemplated under section, under Chapter 5 of the 2007 Act is an, uh, under the 2005 Act is an empowering provision for the welfare of a senior citizen that must be read cohesively with the right of a woman to be protected which is guaranteed under the Act of 2005. Justice Shanti Swarup's case must be confined to the facts of the case. It was a case of a person who had uh, made provision for a son and daughter-in-law for a separate house elsewhere. There were incidents of interest, in, intense disharmony and physical and mental assaults. Now, no two cases are alike. It would be wrong to import the principle of law from the judgment that law recognizes an action for ejectment of for a husband or father-in-law to deny a woman a right to shelter, the most required protection for a woman, the recognition of a right to safety and a non-negotiable tool for nurturing a dignified living. In fact, uh, the, uh, there was uh, uh, the tribune thought that uh, when uh, the uh, when the chief justice obtained uh, protection, it was all in news in somewhere. A local newspaper, you imagine a chief justice coming to court and asking for protection is uh, not a regular happening. Therefore, they take interest. And when I found a method of getting out of it, the tribunal felt very happy. And then it carried a full-page editorial on that day. How women's rights are to be at all times protected and it will obtain precedence over any father, father-in-law's right uh, to eject a daughter-in-law out of the house. So therefore, some way it can still be done and uh, take interest uh, or what can otherwise uh, go as uh, impossible. Now, it, you must remember, uh, West, UP, Rajasthan, Punjab, Haryana are states where uh, the status of women uh, are uh, 
they, they are eternally at some kind of uh, trouble, it's, uh, it's fragile. Uh, I may uh, sound harsh, uh, are we talking about uh, the, the dignified Punjabis and Haryanbis who make, who bring laurels to the country, who in the field of sports and other things, or in fashion industry who are occupying big places, uh, or we, do we dub them all as places of uh, uncivilized uh, uh, persons? No, no, it's not that. I'm saying now, if there it's more prevalent and we need to be cautious that there are provisions of law in place which will protect them wherever they are uh, where they're vulnerable. And we have to find ways and that is possible only through um, some judicial uh, 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 judgment making in ways which will not be really from the rule book. You will have to look beyond and then see how it can be, how we can secure succor to people. Uh, I, I would just uh, do one more uh, case and then I uh, will wind up for any question which you may ask. And um, this is about uh, honor killing. Uh, honor killing is again uh, a problem which festers uh, some of the areas in North India. It's not as if it does not happen in uh, South, but then it's more prevalent there. This was uh, about a case where the man and the woman, they had married outside the caste. And uh, there, this was uh, 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 when the marriage took place. The father of the girl, the mother of the girl, they were very unhappy that the boy was from a lower, ca lower caste. So uh, the, the boy had apprehension that they were going to be done away with and therefore he had given a complaint to the police saying, see, uh, give protection to us. And the protection uh, he had to seek uh, because they, they were apprehensive that the parents will kill them. The Punjab and Haryana High Court had through several judgments created some kind of a, uh, uncertainty about it. One judge said, if, she is, uh, if a, a man wants the company of a woman and uh, he has apprehension that the parents are opposing it, you deposit 5 lakhs of rupees. So therefore, you suddenly found courts uh, imposing condition for protection. A man could be dead otherwise. The court was grant, uh, granting a protection if only amount was going to be deposited to show his bona fides. Yet another judgment said, she is a minor here. The minor cannot seek for protection. Therefore, I am dismissing the application. There was another bench ruling. So uh, then uh, there were issues like this. So therefore when uh, a person comes and uh, the court did not, uh, the, the man had uh, given a complaint to the police and the next day his wife was murdered. So this guy was uh, beyond, uh, it was just not grief, he was beyond himself. And when he had come to my court with a repetition saying, give me protection at least now, proceed against these persons. I know these are the persons I had given, lined up 14 names in my complaint to the police and said, these are the persons who are now really out to kill us and now I lost my wife. I'm going to be killed soon. Take action against these people. These persons must answer for the death of my wife. This was the person. 14 persons had been given. So now, uh, this was uh, truly a situation where there were kind, some, several kind of uh, uh, laws, some, uh, some uh, decisions of the court which was uh, very harsh. Uh, this judgment came, uh, it obtained uh, enormous uh, um, uh, appreciation for something. Not appreciation, no, I'm not uh, take, talking about it with any eye there, but I'm only saying for an idea which many people found was essential. Uh, was what I, uh, and I, th this is what I had said in that uh, case. Uh, I had said it was a case of the wife was suspected to have mur murdered by her parents for marrying a person below her caste. I quoted Dr. Ambedkar's pamphlet on annihilation of caste and ended the case with a slew of police reforms. I wrote an elderly transformation, uh, an orderly transformation of the society would come only through an instrument of law. For law is a potent tool of social engineering and fashions and shapes public opinions. If severe punishment to honor killings has not stopped them, if judicial approaches have not reduced their incidents, and police would only stand as mute spectators, if not active collaborators, we will come to a situation of accepting these honor killings as unstoppable and there are uh, unstoppable that are at once shameful and abhorrent. The society ought to understand that all the economic prog progress and development goals that our policy makers endeavor to secure will be trashed if we cannot respect an adult's autonomy to choose his or her partner to be together with or without marriage. A state of evolution as human beings has been gradual and there is no scientific evidence that any 
raise a community is superior to another. No person could be ground, uh, gra degraded by place of birth, color, or language, or religion. I went on to say that there must be uh, several uh, uh, local friends of police uh, must be set. And they, I said, uh, because uh, Ambedkar had this idea in the year 1937. He advocated for inter-caste marriages as the only way by which annihilation of caste is possible. Unfortunately, the idea seemed too, uh, uh, too progressive for acceptance. The organizers who wanted to invite Ambedkar to make the speech in Lahore ultimately deterred. And Ambedkar could not make the speech. He therefore published the pamphlet later, going by the name Annihilation of Caste. And uh, now, I wrote also in that uh, uh, judgment that matrimonial ads must, all new papers must take a principled stand not to disclose or not to allow for any advertisement which discloses the caste of the person, bride or by groom. Now, uh, it, this, uh, the newspapers themselves were prepared to publish and give a big publicity. I was so happy about it. For you see anywhere, you look at that, you will find uh, a, a Nair girl wants a Nair uh, person, uh, a Brahmin wants a Brahmin, a Baniya wants a Baniya. Have you ever seen a Dalit want a Dalit? Does not ever get to be published, for he has nothing to now even declare. That is the position that we have brought things to. So therefore, uh, it, it is a matter which we, it would require a greater pondering. For all you persons, I see now, I see myself as a failed generation. I would see, that if I see hope, I see hope in persons like you. If caste would ever go at any time, it could be possible, it is possible only through persons like you. We have seen caste coming in various ways. There is no way that we can get out of it. But then, it is necessary in some areas of, to give them protection, to give them uh, education, to give them jobs. It, we still, it does not become totally irrelevant, but then the caste high and the low feeling must somewhere go and we must look in matrimony beyond caste and that, that can happen, it can happen only from persons like you and that is what I wrote in that judgment as well. Now, I have given some ideas. Uh, in the judgments of what I have said, I have done, I, I don't uh, claim that I have done anything superior or extraordinary. But I have at all times seen that judgments will not be taken as merely expressions of settling dispute of one party against another. I was always looking for a larger canvas to fill in and see that other people can also secure some benefits through a judgment of what is written, not merely through a system of precedence, but giving out ideas which at some point of time when it has an age to explode, it will. And uh, I, I thought uh, I should uh, tell you and wind up with this. At some point of time, initially in my practice, uh, your, uh, my, fa my father's uh, um, classmate, P.S. Sundaram, who was uh, a professor in English, he asked me when I was still a young man, uh, do you lie in court? So I told him, uh, I say what I have gathered from my client. So he said, don't be clever. You give me a straight answer. Do you lie in court? I told him, the Bar Council rules require that I should accept a brief without saying no. So therefore, I will do, I will accept cases of what I need to do and say in the court. He knew I was fencing, I was going around, I was uh, not really answering. He didn't press forward. But then on that day, later I realized, I was not feeling comfortable to respond to him clearly and therefore I was looking for evasive answers, the way witnesses state in the witness stand, some evasive answers. I decided on that day, believe me, it was in 1982, I said I will not speak untruth in court. I said I will not tell a lie in court. I will not secure a brief from a party without knowing whether the case was true or not. And I was not a poor off person. I did not probably enjoy an enormous practice, but I was still a designated senior counsel. People recognized that I could speak to the court with the confidence, and there were judges who were prepared to listen to me with rapt attention. If I was speaking, they knew that I had something to say. It is not merely I, again, I am saying now it is possible to develop a good practice with all your emphasis on truth. And if it is done, I am sure it is still a worthwhile life living. And what are we now trying to see through a spiritual life? The spiritual life for me is beginning with an attempt to get at the truth everywhere, in every act of what we do in courts. And then if it is not truth, at least to know what trying to get somewhere near truth. And uh, like I said in the beginning, uh, my friend Mida would say with uh, extraordinary um, flourish, one day I hope to see, is again another man who is all 
crazed up, uh, uh, about the truth and things. I believe, Kannan, one day there will be a God standing somewhere there with his hands like that and projecting himself. That's all my endeavor. I must secure that answer from my God. I don't have a personal God. I'm not really that godly person. Uh, but then I believe that in every case where you are, uh, try to get at the truth or try to find the truth or expound the truth in the way you say, your words somehow get some pregnancy which it otherwise cannot. So therefore, uh, that belief, that will happen to all of you. And he said to me, P.S. On, on that day, he said, P.S. Sivasamiya is the person who I said initially, a uh, person who had been uh, uh, a prominent uh, uh, counsel of uh, uh, the Madras presidency at that time. He was the first ad Indian ad uh, advocate general who was permanent. Bashi Mangar was also supposed to be uh, the first one, but then he was a permanent uh, advocate general of the Madras presidency, P.S. Sivasamiya. He did not utter an uh, untruth. He, he never took a case which was false and he made a promise that he will not do anything untrue. And uh, I would say that uh, this is what is important for us. I, uh, before I close, uh, I would uh, say what is it that I want the students to do? Uh, that uh, I, I used to, I must say, what I have gone through, uh, I used to write short critiques uh, about judgments. I already said about how even as a uh, judge I couldn't shed my ways. I was finding something wrong about the reasoning of a fellow judge and I wrote in my blog and then I withdrew. But then there could be still till today uh, what I wrote uh, of that uh, historic uh, 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 factor as a disqualification. I have not found anyone, any, any lawyer, any professor writing an article about as serious a flaw in judgment as that. And there were you know, persons who were trying to say that was a great exposition of Sikhism, but not anyone to even criticize. Even today you see now, uh, the major judgments of several judgments I've gone through, I can say, I can point out in any area how there are so serious flaws about judgments. Uh, there are uh, some criticisms are written uh, in newspapers. That is not what is correct. We should be writing in magazines, law journals, and we'll have a debate on that. That's what can change law. There are ever so many judgments which are clearly wrong and we need to do that. It's essential that we need critiquing. And uh, I, I, when I was uh, an editor of Madras Law Journal, I believed that I wrote to the reading uh, public the, of the legal professionals that I will bring only cases for reporting which will have a statement of law. I will therefore capture above the uh, judgment, text of judgment, the ratio decide and the, the ratio ness decide and the. I would say something like that. I will try to see that there was a law there, otherwise I will not report. But I know, as an editor, ever so many judges will call you to a chamber and then give you several judgments. Sir, you put all these things for your report. And an editor has to please the judge and therefore will report everything. So you find that, of so many cases of what you see in the Supreme Court cases, ever so many judgments which make no law. There are ever so many areas, like Land Acquisition Act, Motor Vehicles Act. They have no new law to make at all. But there are the cases which are filling up all of uh, journals. Because that is the easiest thing to do. You don't really work for any constitutional interpretations and that is not done. It's rather uh, difficult. Therefore, you have, even in the Supreme Court, the quality of judgments are what they are because there is no one who is seriously criticizing about what is written. There is no one who is prepared to bring a critique of what is clearly wrong in several of the pronouncements. Who, are going to, who is going to be doing that? It should come from the academic community of persons. Even the law books, you see what kind of persons are writing. Not too many law professors are writing. And it is some retired judge who is writing or editing. I have done all that. Why should I be uh, I, I, thinking at all times? I am not at all times the best person to write. I would have expected at any time persons from the uh, academic community to write books. Important and serious books on law must be books which must be written by law professors. They are not writing enough. So therefore, there is a serious area. That's, a, that's an area where you must be doing. I have, for instance, I, I had a good library at home. My father used to write uh, his uh, plaint as though it is a story. You will you'll correct it ten times before a plaint is put into the uh, uh, court. He would have corrected it. Every word you will try to see correctly. And when he dictates, you will dictate with uh, full stop, comma, semicolon, which, which so clear about how it would come. 
I had the, the benefit of that kind of a learning. Law at all times teaches. Now I have a person here and uh, I've never come to it with th with thinking that I've understood any anything. I have still, uh, I would record uh, any appreciation or any input from any person who's younger to me. Day before yesterday, I probably yesterday, a person here, Mridula, gave me an explanation of uh, uh, section 114, uh, illustration 2. I never found it comfortable for me to understand. She gave me an answer for me, which I, I, I feel uh, happy that she's here. And I uh, took a lesson from her. So therefore, there are things to learn from everyone. You have that humility to know that there is so many things which are happening, you would know, you will learn. And uh, that, I would think, is important for us. Uh, there is uh, so much that you can do to identify what is uh, good, what is correct. You can read, write. There is no way of understanding a law better than writing on that. All my understanding of succession law or tort law or uh, 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 landlord and tenant, uh, these are books which I wrote and therefore I try to believe that I have really understood a lot of things. Even there I, I confess I always have some doubts. And uh, the, several of the uh, prominent uh, books of Mullah when I could uh, edit, it was uh, great I used to think, or Modi's jurisprudence of uh, toxicology when I was editing, when I was working with four or five doctors, uh, I suddenly realized there is so much, in every field it gives you so many interesting things. And a person in litigation need not necessarily be only fighting in courts. There are ways of keeping our interest in law alive at all times. There is so much to do. And it should be when we are talking about uh, a, a colorful life. A colorful life comes through colorful activities, a whole lot of activities. And a Brazilian author, a philosopher, says like this, individually, every grain of sand brushing against my hands represents a story, an experience, and a block for me to build upon for the next generation. Your knowledge and experience through law shall be your books and shall be your bricks to build the world just not for yourselves but for the next generation. Thank you very much students. <laughs>